station. This is Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. How do you hear me? RPI, I hear you loud and clear. Welcome to the International Space Station. And liftoff. Liftoff of Reed Wiseman, Max Sarayev, and Alexander Gerst. TMA 11M, Karen Mikhail Turin, Rick Mastracchio, and Koichi Okada now separated from the International Space Station. It's amazing you spend your whole life trying to get off the Earth, it seems like, and then as soon as you get into low Earth orbit, the first thing you do is turn around and look back at the Earth and see how beautiful it was. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jeff Shantz. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Alumni Relations at Rensselaer, and welcome back to Reunion and Homecoming 2014. And welcome to Rensselaer in Space, live from the International Space Station with Reed Weissman, class of 1997. This is indeed a very special day for all of us, and it is the culmination of nearly a year of planning between NASA and many individuals here at Rensselaer. The road to this day began with a simple email back in the fall from an alumnus, which is not one you get every day, which said, quote, fellow RPI alumnus Rick Mastracchio and I are going to the International Space Station next year. Can you send me some RPI stuff? <laughs> As you might imagine, this is not your typical email that starts our day. And so we responded affirmatively and sent shirts and hats and the now famous RPI banner that you have most likely seen hanging in the space station since last fall when Rick was there. Since then, we have been watching our two alumni astronauts doing the amazing work on the International Space Station. And I have had the great fortune to interact with Reed throughout the trip as we plan for today. And I want you all to know what you'll see in a little while, how remarkable of a person he truly is. I want you to know that it was Reed's request to speak with you all here today, and in fact, 
This is Reed's own astronaut time. This is his own downtime before they, they go to sleep on Houston time, which will allow him to be with us today. So with the flight director's permission, he has truly given his precious time to Rensselaer. And so today, we have the unique opportunity to witness a live broadcast from space. At approximately 2.40 p.m. Houston time, or 3.40 p.m. Eastern time, Reed, if all goes well, and we know it will, will be on the large screen behind me, ready to greet all of us here who have gathered to see him and congratulate him on his remarkable journey so far. And finally, I would like to also personally thank astronaut Stephanie Wilson, who took part in the planning of many shuttle missions and actually went on the shuttle Discovery three times. She's America's second African-American woman to travel to space, and she assisted us and Reed to make this a memorable day here at his alma mater. But before we meet Reed, we are very grateful to have with us today Dr. Jackson, who will speak to us about the remarkable journey Rensselaer has been on with America's space program. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always an honor to present to you our 18th president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson. Well, good afternoon. And thank you, Jeff. And let me welcome back to Rensselaer, our alumni and alumnae, and of course, our students and all members of the Rensselaer family and community here today. I'm really quite excited and delighted to join all of you here for a conversation uh, with astronaut Reed Wiseman of the Rensselaer class of 1997 from the International Space Station. Reed recognizably is a Rensselaer graduate and I'm certain that he has much in common with many of you. Clearly he is fulfilling a remarkable assignment as flight engineer for expeditions 40 and 41 aboard the International Space Station. But he is doing so much more. He is using an array of talents to promote exploration, innovation, education, and discovery. In July, he answered questions from members of the US House of Representatives Committee on, space, on science, space, and technology. And he eloquently emphasized the importance of federal investments in research and education while in orbit 260 miles above Washington, D.C. Probably look better from there. Now, even more remarkably, as you saw in the vi video, he is employing social media to bring the wonders of space to an enchanted and rapidly growing Twitter audience that today numbers over 300,000 followers. Of course, that audience is there because Reed is a superb photographer, as you got a sense of here, and a vivid and witty writer, in addition to being a remarkable systems engineer. In other words, Reed is demonstrating precisely the intellectual agility and what he has shown us about the earth, the multicultural sophistication that we strive to encourage in our students and that indeed has deep roots in the Rensselaer pedagogy, extending all the way back to Benjamin Franklin Green, who led the Institute in the 1850s. Professor Green established departments of rhetoric and philosophy and argued that Rensselaer students should receive a scientific, literary, philosophic, artistic education before they embarked upon their studies in applied science or art. The magnificent building that we're in, the Curtis R. Prem Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center, or IMPAC as we call it, clearly states that we also believe that a scientific and technological education should be panoramic. And much of discovery and innovation, as you know, takes place at the nexus of disciplines where, for example, the performing arts meet cognitive science, or data analytics meet immersive technologies, or microbiology meets chemical engineering. As we ground our students in the fundamentals of a discipline, we educate them to make connections between unrelated fields, unlinked ideas, and disparate perspectives. 
in order to unleash their own creativity and discovery and innovation. In many cases, we invent the very tools of connection here at Rensselaer, including some that Reed Wiseman is employing in space. And these include the digital camera invented by Stephen Sasson of the Rensselaer class of 1972, the ampersand sign of Reed's Twitter handle, which allows his enthusiastic followers to retweet his posts into the stratosphere, owes a debt to Ray Tomlinson of the class of 1963, who invented network electronic mail and put the ampersand sign into its addresses. Now today, and I'm not gonna spend time this afternoon talking about it, we are remaking Rensselaer into what we call the new polytechnic, which uses new technologies and tools as Reed has with social media to connect, to lead, and to enable collaborative endeavors across disciplines, sectors, and even global regions. And we're doing this so that together we can tackle the world's great challenges, which are far too complex to be addressed by any single person, organization, field of study, or nation. Now, the Rensselaer history in space, in fact, suggests the value of the vision we have of the new Polytechnic as a place where different perspectives are, in fact, united, using advanced technologies in order to improve lives and to further humanity's store of knowledge. Space exploration is multidisciplinary by definition, requiring remarkable feats of aeronautical engineering, electrical engineering, material science and engineering, biological science, computer science, physics, robotics, and much more. Space also is a laboratory where research in numerous scientific disciplines occurs, as you'll hear from Cynthia Collins shortly. And space, as Reed Wiseman has shown us, is a subject of beauty and fascination meant to inspire artists, designers, engineers, scientists, and entrepreneurs. Many Rensselaer people have made their marks in space exploration. George M. Lowe of the classes of 1948 and 1950 and the 14th president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute was on the planning team for the founding of NASA. In his 26 years with NASA, he helped to direct the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs and to send men to the moon, the most daring of human achievements. Among the astronauts Lowe oversaw at NASA was Jack Swigert of the Rensselaer class of 1965. Mr. Swigert was a backup pilot for Apollo 13. When the primary command module pilot, who had trained with his team for two years, was exposed to German measles, Mr. Swigert was forced to take over and to head into space after just two days of training with his crew. They were 200,000 miles from Earth when an oxygen tank blew up, knocking out the electricity, light, and water supply of the Apollo 13 command module. Now, the cool-headed crew was able to improvise and manage to return safely to Earth. Our remarkable astronauts also include Rick Mastracchio of the class of 1987, whom you saw in the video, one of the most experienced spacewalkers in history. In, no in November of 2013, Rick took, as you heard from Jeff, to the International Space Station, the Rensselaer banner that Reed will bring home. Though we truly delight in our space travelers, and there's something very compelling about astronauts. The Rensselaer history in space also encompasses engineering design and research. Alumni Kobe Boykins of the class of 1996, Michael Meyer of the class of 1974, and Frederick Sericchio of the class of 1994 worked on different aspects of the Curiosity rover mission which is investigating whether there ever could have been life on Mars. Curiosity has found environments that potentially would have been habitable 
by certain kinds of microorganisms. And as host of the New York Center for Astrobiology, Rensselaer has a number of faculty and students exploring the possibilities of extraterrestrial life. These include Professor Wayne Roberge of our Department of Physics, Applied Physics, and Astronomy, who recently proposed a new theory to explain the seeds of life in asteroids. Professor Cynthia Collins of our Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering, on the other hand, investigates the behavior of terrestrial life in the unique conditions of space. An expert in microbial communities, she has used two missions of the space shuttle Atlantis to study the biofilms formed by opportunistic pathogens. Now, I don't want to give away her surprise. I'll just say that she's made a surprising discovery. Now, it, but that discovery raises questions about the role of gravity in microbial growth with potential implications for the control of disease, not just in spaceflight, but also here at home. And I'm delighted that she is here with us today to tell us about her research. And finally, Rensselaer is home to faculty and students who consider the nature of space itself and the most fundamental mysteries of the universe. Professor Heidi Newberg of our Department of Physics, Applied Physics and Astronomy, studies the location of dark matter in the Milky Way galaxy in hopes of finding clues that would lead to the detection of as yet unknown particles that constitute dark matter. By partnering with Rensselaer computer scientists, she has been pursuing these investigations in a very inventive way. She founded the Milky Way at Home Project, which analyzes the data gathered from star surveys to create models of the shape, density, and motion of stars pulled gravitationally from dwarf galaxies in the Milky Way. Using donated home computing power from tens of thousands of volunteers in one of the fastest distributed computing programs ever operated. This then is the very essence of the new Polytechnic and an excellent example of precisely what is so special about Rensselaer. We connect people from all over the globe to enable discovery and innovation, to deepen our understanding of the smallest quanta as well as the largest expanses of space and of everything in between. So as we approach the 200th anniversary of the founding of this great institute and embark upon the bridge to our bicentennial, the entire Rensselaer family should be proud of our long history of, in fact, reaching for the stars and happily anticipate the discoveries and the innovations to come as we continue reaching far, far overhead into every part of the universe. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Let's enjoy the program. Thank you, thank you Dr. Jackson. As Dr. Jackson mentioned in her remarks, we are delighted to have with us today Dr. Cynthia Collins, professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering, who has been investigating the behavior of terrestrial life in the unique conditions of space. Professor Collins joined the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering at RPI in March of 2008 as an assistant professor. Cynthia grew up in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. She obtained her honors bachelor's in chemistry, bachelor's in science and chemistry and biochemistry from the University of Toronto in 2000, and her PhD in biochemistry and molecular biophysics from Caltech in 2006. Her educational and research efforts have recently been recognized with several honors, including Rensselaer School of Engineering Education Innovation Award, an NSF Career Award, and a NASA Group Achievement Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Cynthia Collins. Good afternoon, everyone. 
I'm really delighted to be here today and tell you a little bit about the work that my group has done recently. Um, it's very much a collaborative effort. Um, but before I start, um, you know, I think I would love to mention what an exciting time it is to be at RPI right now. Um, so we recently celebrated the 10th anniversary of the Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary Studies, which is where my lab is located when we're not spending time at Kennedy Space Center. Um, and as many of you know, it's actually the 100th anniversary of the Chemical and Biological Engineering Department, and so I know I'll see many of you tomorrow at our festivities celebrating that event. All right, so why do we care about microbial growth in spaceflight? So people have examined how different microbes grow, looking at experiments done um, on the shuttle, on the International Space Station, and found that microbes grown in liquid culture, so what we might think of as in a test tube or suspension culture, often show increases in biomass, increased antibiotic resistance, and increases in virulence. Um, and so you can imagine that that could be challenging, and it can be especially challenging if we think about how astronauts and other mammals, even flies that have been grown um, under microgravity conditions, behave. And that is that they often have different symptoms that indicate immunosuppression. Um, and if you combine increase in virulence with a potential for easier susceptibility to infection, right, this is something that we really need to explore, especially if we want to move towards long-term spaceflight. And of course, any time that we can understand how microbes may affect the human body, how we can have virulence or be able to combat that, that's important not just for what goes on on the International Space Station or on our next mission to Mars, but also what goes on on the ground today. Um, and so, what are biofilms? Let me tell you a little bit about that first. So I've shown them on the left, or the right panel here. Um, so biofilms are these three-dimensional structures that bacteria form on surfaces. Um, this is a few examples here. So we have something with a suture. All of you contact lens wearers, remember that you really need to be washing them and changing them as your doctor prescribes. Um, and of course, they can be challenging in industrial settings too. So it's an example of a pipe that has some biomass forming on the inside of it that can cause things like corrosion and other types of mechanical failures. And bacterial biofilms, these structures, are actually implicated in more than 65% of um, different types of infections. And so while we may often think about microbes as these liquid cultures, um, the biofilms is kind of how they really exist. The challenge was, it was that no one had really looked systematically at biofilms and how they're formed in, in space or on the space station before we embarked on this research effort. They looked at these suspension cultures, but not the real world, really important kind of system. And so I'm going to tell you today what we've done towards that effort. So I'm going to start with telling you how we actually carry out these experiments. So how do we think about doing experiments on this International Space Station or Space Shuttle? So we have this interesting hardware. And I'm going to tell you it's called a fluid processing apparatus. It's essentially a glass cylinder with a bevel on the side. And so you can see here kind of gently that there's a bevel on the side. And we load it with different media components. So we start with the growth media for the cells. We add some inoculum. And then sometimes we add a fixative. Um, and then they're separate. So when we load them, they're all separate. We make sure everything's sterile. And then some samples go up on the International Space Station. And so what's really nice about this simple bevel is once we essentially activate them, you can see that once you push on the top and it goes down, you can see that the chambers mix. Right? And so this way, an astronaut who's actually helping us with our experiments on the space shuttle or on the space, uh, station can actually mix the components for us to start our experiment by mixing the media with the cells and then stopping the experiment by adding some sort of fixative. And so since an astronaut's not going to sit there with his finger plunging one thing at a time, we have a device that allows them to plunge eight at a time. And so that's this device here. And so what an astronaut needs to do is insert a crank on the top. And this is actually our samples on the Space Shuttle Atlantis, our first mission um, in 2010. And you can see the astronaut has the crank on here. And all he needs to do is essentially crank them and mix our samples. So to start the experiment, he changes the temperature in our incubator mixes the media with the cells. We let that go for three days. And then some samples are fixed with a formaldehyde, and other ones we just decrease the temperature. And then we bring them back to Kennedy Space Center. And then we compare the results from the samples that were conducted on um, Space Shuttle Atlantis to the ones that happened on Earth. And so what did we look at in particular? So these experiments were conducted during two space shuttle missions, the last two Atlantis missions in 2010 and 11. 
Um, and we had these ground controls at Kennedy Space Center. Actually, my entire lab had to go and spend a month at Kennedy Space Center twice. And as a young professor, that was really exciting because I got to take my whole lab and have kind of this unique bonding exper experience and do experiments in space. Um, and so the organism we looked at that I'm going to tell you about today is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It is a gram-negative bacteria. It's motile, and it's an opportunistic human pathogen. It's also a really well-studied model of biofilm formation. And so when we were looking at biofilms, we looked at two things. So we brought the biofilms back, we washed them gently, and then looked at how many viable cells we had in the biofilms that were formed and compared them to ground controls. And then we also did image analysis. So for some of our samples, we brought them back. We actually put them on a plane, flew them back to RPI, and then used the great confocal facilities that we have in the um, CBIS Center and made um, three-dimensional images of the biofilms. And so we can do computational analysis of these to figure out how thick the biofilms, how much we have, and then also look at what their structure looks like. So now I can tell you a little bit about what we found. So this is a kind of a, a slide of our key, essentially, finding with this organism. And so the kind of take home message from this is that all the gray bars are bigger than all the black bars. Um, and it doesn't matter what method we used, either we used um, the viable cell counting or the biofilm image analysis, we formed, found more biofilm formed by this organism in spaceflight compared to normal gravity. Um, and I won't go into too much detail in terms of what the other variables are, but we looked at different media conditions. So we looked at an artificial urine media because it was a good media we could use that was important for biofilms both inside and outside the human body in a space kind of situation. And then we looked at variables like phosphate availability, which is a key nutrient, and then the carbon source that is available. But we played with all of those different variables and found that no matter what we did, we always found more biofilm formed by this organism during spaceflight, which is a pretty important kind of thing to know as we move towards long-term spaceflight. And I will mention that one astronaut in one of the early Apollo missions actually had a pseudomonas infection. Um, and so this is really important as we move forward. So the other thing we wanted to look at was what the structure of the biofilms are. And so we looked at the side view I'm showing you here. Um, and we could see that our wild type, essentially in normal gravity, look kind of flat. So this is the surface of it. And you can kind of see the, the, from the side view that this is all a bunch of cells. Um, and then we looked at a motility mutant. So motility is really essential for biofilm formation in this organism. And so the delta mote ABCD is a wild type, um, uh, sorry, a mutant of this organism where it can't swim through the media. So we've essentially knocked out that ability. Um, and you can see in normal gravity, those two biofilms don't look very different. But in spaceflight, you see quite a, quite a big difference. Um, so of course, you can see that they're thicker in spaceflight here. But you can also see that the structure looks a little bit different. So this is kind of flat, and this looks like it's thicker, and maybe there's some open space under here. And so this looked very interesting to us. You don't really see space underneath um, biofilms like this. And so for a while, my student and I had discussions about whether or not he had flipped the biofilms upside down, the images were upside down. Um, but after many discussions, and actually finding this in many samples from both of our spaceflight missions, we actually decided that this is real and that something is going on here. So, so in order to kind of give you a better idea of how to visualize this, I'm going to show you in a slightly different manner because it's kind of hard to see from the side view. So what I'm going to show you is essentially top views but shown in cross section. So I'm going to show you the area right at the base, so right near the um, base of the biofilm or right near the cellulose membrane, something a little higher up and something um, even higher. And so for a normal biofilm that we would see on Earth, we would really expect all the biofilm to be on the surface. And then as you get higher, you would see less thick biofilm. And so in our normal gravity system, which is on the left here, you can actually see a totally flat biofilm. And it's not they're very thick. It's about 10.6 microns. But in our space flight sample, we actually can see these kind of columns that form on the bottom with space in between them. Um, and then on top, we have this thick, dense colony um, canopy, um, and then it's quite a bit thicker. And then we noticed if we have both normal gravity or our spaceflight samples, that we see these flat biofilms, both for normal gravity and spaceflight, with our motility mutants. And so there's something, some role that motility is playing in this different kind of structure we've seen. And I want to really highlight that no one has seen this kind of structure before um, in Earth-type experiments. And so when we look at the literature and try to see what do people understand about Pseudomonas um, biofilm, you can see 
that they see things like this in, on Earth, so these mushroom-shaped biofilms. And these also require motility. So if you knock out those swimming genes, you see a flat biofilm. And so we believe that these phenotypes are related. And so we're seeing this, this column and canopy biofilm when there's no flow and no gravity. So you can see that these mushrooms on normal gravity are limited by hydrodynamic flow and gravity. So instead of right, being limited how far your cap can go out, it can go out forever in the absence of gravity. Um, and this is really exciting, and to the best of our knowledge, no one has seen anything like this on Earth before. And so as you know, chemical engineers, we kind of want to know why are we seeing this increase in biofilm formation? We don't just want to know that we see it, we'd like to have a, an understanding. And so we believe that the changes that we see in microbes during spaceflight are they're responding to changes in their environment, changes in right, transport or fluid mechanics. Um, and so our hypothesis is kind of like this. So in normal gravity, the cells settle to the bottom and you have biofilm forming on the bottom of, this, of your surface um, because that's where the cells are gonna interact more. But at the local area, you may have you know, product inhibition, so things that are produced by the cells that prevent them from growing any further, or things where you, you locally run out of nutrients. Whereas in the microgravity environment or spaceflight, things are well mixed. Everyone has more access to nutrients and you can th have things grow a lot better. Um, and so if we think about this, um, and working with my collaborator and colleague, Joel Pulaski, we built a mathematical model representing the system. We can also identify other parameters that might play an important role in spaceflight. And one of those is, is the affinity of the microbe for a particular surface and whether or not it can get there. So you can imagine that this might be really great for mixing, but if you need to go to a surface and start forming a biofilm, you might really decrease the probability of that happening um, in spaceflight. And so to, do, to look at that, we can look at another microorganism, Staphylococcus aureus. So along with Pseudomonas, this is, causes a lot of hospital-acquired um, infections, um, and especially antimicrobial uh, resistance can be challenging with this organism. And so it's a gram-positive, non-motel organism, and it's also part of 60% of our skin, um, for people's skin. So, you know, odds are it's probably up in the International Space Station because, right, we need it to be happy and healthy. And so in this case, we actually saw that microgravity led to a decrease in biofilm formation. And so this leads us to believe that some of our right, improved understanding of the parameters that are causing biofilm formation and that may affect how microbes are responding to spaceflight right, are a better improved at the moment. And so hopefully we've gained some insight into biofilms um, and how they might grow in spaceflight. And so I just want to close with a couple of remarks. And so I, you know, hopefully I've convinced you that microbial biofilm formation is affected by the spaceflight environment. And also that Pseudomonas biofilms um, have a unique structure. And I really want to highlight right, that Pseudomonas biofilms increased, Staph aureus decreased. So it's not necessarily all about microbes growing more and being virulent. You know, I really love microbial communities and I think most of the time they do a really good job of keeping us happy and healthy and playing roles in human health that we're only finally starting to discover. And so keeping in mind how we can improve our understanding of them is really important. Um, and I really hope that our experiments are a good step towards being able to design new experiments that will allow us to predict how a particular microbe might respond to the spaceflight environment and whether or not it would exhibit increased virulence, increased growth, increased biofilm formation without having to wait till a crew is halfway to Mars and it has to deal with these kinds of problems. I think there are also new opportunities. So looking at the microbiome. So how do microbial communities interact with people, how do, what is the microbial communities that, in, that are growing on the International Space Station? The International Space Station is this really unique environment where all the microbes you find on a surface are from people, right? Whereas the microbial, right, microbial community organisms that you find here are gonna be things people have brought in on their shoes from, right, from dirt, from soil, and those kinds of things. And so as we think about the built environment, as the microbes affect our health, looking at an International Space Station, looking at how things are here versus down, you know, in New York City, lots of different areas of research. And I think there's opportunities for synthetic biology and biotechnology, which is the other, my other love in terms of research. And so I really would love to see a day when we've got microbes and we've got a DNA synthesizer and we can say, well, I'm halfway to Mars and I really need to be able to make this drug. Okay, I'm gonna make that DNA and I'm gonna be able to do it, no problem. And of course, if we could do that on the way to Mars in our, um, 
space shuttle, then maybe we can do it in Africa or wherever else we need it on demand. And so I think hopefully this all ties together um, and we have a lot of new research and new places to go. And so with that, I just want to conclude. Um, I just want to acknowledge, of course, my team that did all this work, definitely teamwork. And the nice thing about doing stuff with NASA is your experiments get mission patches. Um, and so that's ours from 2010 and 2011. So Micro 2 and Micro 2A were our experiments. So my collaborators, John and Joel, um, and then all the students in red are the ones that spent a lot of time and effort on this. And the underlined ones are our undergraduates who are now off in graduate school being successful on their own. So thank you very much for your time. Reed, this is Rensselaer. How do you hear us? Hey, I've got you loud and clear. How do you have me? <laughs> Reed, this is Jeff Shantz at RPI. We're, we're really honored to be with you here today. And uh, we, uh, we see you, and we love your shirt. And, uh, <laughs> We'd like, <laughs> and we, uh, we are here at the Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center, MPAC, with about five or 600 of your closest friends. And um, we want to give you an opportunity to say hello and greet us all here. And then I have a very special first question for you. Okay, well, what an honor for me to be up here 260 miles up and be able to talk to uh, my old university there, RPI, it is really, uh, it's just a great day for me up here. Hopefully you don't get too much feedback off the mic. If you do, we'll have to change it. Uh, but, uh, you know, we are, we are abs absolutely busting it up here right now with science. And we just did a spacewalk a few days ago, so it's super busy. But there's always time to just kick back and have a little fun. And if it's Friday evening and I get to talk to RPI, well, then that's a, that's a great start to the weekend. <laughs> Uh, Reed, we have a very special person here. Uh, that's our 18th president, Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson, and she'd like to ask you our first question, okay? Absolutely. Uh, let me start with go red, and then uh, uh, I'm ready for the question. <laughs> Hi, Reed. This is Shirley Jackson. Let me just say, we are so proud of you, and thank you for doing this. Let me respond briefly with how proud I am to have come from RPI and the roots that they laid down for me. And it's uh, honestly, it's my honor to talk to you tonight. Well, in fact, you have spoken very graciously about the many gifts you have had in your career and that you owe many of them to the education, the life education that you received here at RPI. Can you tell us a little bit about your time here and, and how does it relate to what you're doing now? Well, wow. so when you, when you head off to college, uh, you're just a kid and you're leaving for most of us, at least for me, I was pretty sheltered, leaving my parents for the first time and heading up to RPI. And my, my dorm room was up at Bar H, which was way up at the top of the hill. And originally I thought that was a great thing. And then I met the winters in Troy, New York, and I realized that maybe the quad or the e-dorm would have been a better place, a better place to live that freshman year. But, uh, but really, what, what RPI gave me was just that foundation, and that's what the undergraduates are getting there right now, whether they know it or not. They're getting an amazing education, but then on the other side, I think equally important, they're getting a foundation in life skills, how to take care of yourself, how to manage yourself, your friends, your family, your free time, your work time, and really, time management, self-management, and then knowledge is what RPI gave me, and those are the keys to a great future. All of my friends from RPI have been incredibly successful, so it's just a testament to the school and, and what, what you all are doing up there. It's fantastic. Well, th thank you so much. You said, let's go red. I say, let's go read. Thank you. <laughs> and they're gonna ask you a question in order, and we're gonna start with the, the great class of 1979. Oh, 
Good afternoon, Ree. This is truly an honor for us to speak with you this afternoon. I'm from the class of 79. My name is Janice Mahan. This seems to be a dream come true. So when you were a freshman at RPI, was this already your dream? How did, how did it come about, and how did you make it happen? Oh, when I was a freshman at RPI, I think I just wanted to pass calculus and do well in my physics lab experiment. To me, that was the thing that was closest, uh, the closest alligator to the canoe, if you will. But I loved, I loved the sight of airplanes flying, and I watched a few shuttle launches when I was a kid, and so to me, that was really just something that I dreamed about. I definitely dreamed about it when I was at RPI, and my whole life, I just tried to keep that door open, the door to flying into space. So after RPI, I joined the Navy, I became a pilot, and then from there, it seemed like becoming a test pilot was, not only was it a lot of fun, but that was opening another door into the astronaut program. And then from there, just you, you just look back on your life at all these lucky little spots. And, uh, and here I am, 250 miles up, we're going 18,000 miles an hour now, and uh, it's just fantastic, it's awesome. Thank you. Hi, Reed. I'm Allie Woodford, the class of 93. It's such a privilege to be able to speak with you. With all the preparation and anticipation of going to the International Space Station, what have been the biggest surprises in settling in? You know, the good stuff and not so good stuff. Oh, that's a great question. So uh, you, you live your life always with gravity. And it doesn't matter how many years of training you go through to come up here into space, but as soon as they turn off the thrusters and, uh, and you're floating, your entire world becomes something that you can't even imagine. All the food, so this is the good and the bad all together in one. Uh, all the food that's always settled in your stomach now floats in your stomach. When you swallow, the gravity that helped that food go down isn't there anymore. When you go to the bathroom, the gravity that helps you isn't there anymore, and it takes a couple weeks for your, it really takes a couple, <laughs> couple weeks for your body to get over these feelings, and then uh, come about the end of the first month, this was just natural, and, uh, and I continue to get better every day up here, and uh, it really, I, the human body is an amazing machine. It's the best machine that we have, and it adapts incredibly quickly, and, and now this feels just like home, and I'm sure now when I go back in November, I will definitely miss weightlessness. <laughs> okay, Reed, we have Sonia next from 2003. Hi, Reed. Thank you for doing this for us. Um, really, really, oh, this is exciting. I never thought I could do this. Um, my question is about the spacewalk you did on Tuesday. Uh, I think we all want to know more about the assignment and how it went and, and you know, how did it feel to do a spacewalk? So, I. I think we only have 20 minutes, but uh, maybe we should extend this for three or four hours. The spacewalk, that was an amazing experience. I went out, uh, this is my first space flight, and it was my first spacewalk. And uh, just behind the camera right now is my German crewmate, Alex Gerst, also his first space flight and his first spacewalk. So for us to go out together as two rookie first-time spacewalkers, that was huge for us. And I gotta be honest, I was pretty scared leading up to the spacewalk, but uh, as soon as I opened the hatch, and I looked down on our Earth, what I saw was we were over the ocean and the moon was really bright and it was kind of bouncing off the water. And, uh, and everything just became really calm. And we went out there and we did our job. I, I wish I could say that it wasn't that way, but it was. It was just, it was, it was great. It was exactly like training, except the gains were much, much higher. And so overall, our, our tasks were pretty simple. We had three major ones. We stowed a broken uh, pump module that needed to be stored away for safekeeping. And then we rewired the robotic arm to give it some more capabilities. And then also, uh, Alex, my crewmate, he replaced one of our uh, uh, lights on a television camera group so that we can have better lighting at night. And that sounds very simple. In the end, it was six and a half hours of work, and my fingertips are still sore, my shoulders are still sore. So it is, uh, it's brutal, but it's amazing. Thank you. Reed, next up is Dave Haviland from the class of 64. <laughs> you can tell, Reed, it's our 50th, and we're pretty proud of it. 
You know, ever since uh, 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 astronauts went into space and started looking back at the Earth, it changed our whole view of Earth. You've been up there for a while. You go over constantly. We've seen some of your photos. What goes through your mind as you now, on a routine, everyday basis, look back at us here on Earth? Oh, wow. Uh, that is just such a, it's such a great question. It's such a deep question. And I, people always say they don't have words to, to describe it up here. And I really don't. All I can say is you look at our Earth, and the first day you're in space, you look in awe. Because the atmosphere is just this deep blue, and it's so tiny. It's so impossibly tiny. And to think that all the folks down there, all the animals, everything is supported by that little band of blue, it takes your breath away. And then as you're up here for the end of your first week, you're used to these day-night cycles, and maybe you've seen some aurora in the north or the south, and you're just struck by the beauty. The beauty is just, it's just always there. No matter when you look outside, our Earth is beautiful. And then you start to see the impact of humans on Earth. You see farms, you see dams, you see all this stuff, and you know where the cities are. You can see airports, and, and those are your friends, your family, and uh, so that's always neat to see. But what you start to realize after a month or two months or now for me almost five months up here is that Earth is alive. It's really alive. I watch sands from the Sahara Desert get picked up and blown all the way across the Atlantic over into Brazil. Uh, we followed them all the way across. Uh, you can see the weather patterns changing. I, see t I saw a, a huge typhoon this morning. And so what it really reminds me is that we're all living creatures and our planet is, is alive just like all of us. It's always changing, it's always throwing surprises, but without a doubt, it's always beautiful. Reed, next up is Kevin Dye. Hey Reed, this is amazing. Um, so you are of course a pioneer and leader of space and space travel, but I think to many of us you're also uh, one of, you represent one of the many distinguished Rensselaer alumni who have made a profound impact in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, so my question is what advice do you have to offer to those of us who are looking to find that niche and you know, make our own impact on society. Wow, that's, uh, that's a really good question. And uh, you know, the thing I didn't catch, I don't know if you can respond, is what class are you? I'll, I'll give you a second to respond. 2014, so five months ago I graduated. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me tell you, that's gonna be a great day in your life, and then you're ready for the next big adventure. So. Uh, the, the, the advice I, I would give is that you got one life to live. You, you really have one adventure to live. And if you ever wake up in the morning, and sure, there's going to be days where you wake up and you don't want to go to work. But if you wake up and you say, you know what, I'm an engineer and I, I've always wanted to be a writer, then try it. Take a plunge, do an experiment, experiment a little with your life, and if it doesn't work out, come back but try to grow yourself at all times. And I, you're at Rensselaer right now, so you already took one gigantic leap in your life, and you threw yourself into a very uncomfortable situation at an extremely difficult uh, engineering institute. And so I know you're capable of it, and I know your, your classmates are capable of it. So if you find yourself stagnant, if you find yourself bored, it's time to just take a little adjustment and, and follow your heart, follow that dream. And if it doesn't work out, you, you've got a great background that you can fall back on. But if you never reach out, if you never go a little bit past that point of comfort, you'll never know how far you can go. That, that's, I think that's the best way I can say it. Reed, I'm going to invite uh, a member of our faculty, Dr. Cynthia Collins, who's the uh, in our School of Chemical and Bio Department of uh, Chemical and Biological Engineering, to ask you a question. And she's done some research with NASA as well. Hi, Reed. Um, so um, I want to first tell you that I'm a big fan of your uh, Twitter feed, um, and I really appreciate how you share your experiences with us. And I think it's also getting a lot of people excited about space again. Um, and so I was lucky enough to have experiments on two of the last Atlantis shuttle missions looking at microbes. And I know that you are a strong proponent of space um, and research and science and all of those links together and what we can do in the future. And so I would just like to know what it's like for you to do our experiments or experiments on, on the International Space Station and, and 
what does that make you feel and how do you feel your role and in what the importance of that is in the future? Well, so I, I can start answering that with, uh, I, I, I left RPI as an engineer and then I became a Navy pilot. And so I'm really an operator and I, I've never had the chance to be a functioning scientist or an engineer. And I always wanted to. I had that RPI education and I, I've always wanted to do it. And the neat thing for me up here is whenever I flip a switch, and right now behind me, there's so much science going on. We have fish over here. Uh, I actually hung the Rensselaer banner up on this microscope that's looking at some experiments that we did earlier this week. But whenever we, we do anything, we are supported by, by people like you, a phenomenal ground team, and it's their experiment. It's their hardware. And I am really, just like when I fly a jet in the Navy, I'm an operator. So you tell me what to do, and I am the implementer. So I'm here to do it. The thing that I love about being up here is when I'm talking to these ground teams and they're, they're watching, we have cameras everywhere and they're watching my every move and I will do something and I can hear them on the radio all go, whoa, that was unexpected. Do that again, that was unexpected. And, and here the space station has been flying for 15 years, 15 years, and every time I do an experiment, I have almost the same reaction out of the ground team. Whether we're looking at fluids, flame research, our zebra fish, we have mice down there, we're doing T cell work. Uh, so it doesn't matter, but anywhere we touch things in microgravity, the, the outcome is always just a little bit different. And that's what I love. I love that interaction with the team. And my favorite is when they go, oh, we didn't expect that. That's the best. Hi, Reed. This is Janice again. I'm going to throw you a couple of softballs. Uh, some of my classmates from 79 want to know whether you still drink Tang up there. And two, and two, when you come back, where do you want to go on vacation? <laughs> Those are two great questions. So we do have, we have this, uh, I don't even have a, a water bag with me, but we have to drink everything out of a bag with a straw, and then written on the bag is what, what is inside, what type of sweetener, and so we have something called an orange drink, and I'm pretty sure there is Tang inside of it, but I think we can't, I, I think we can't say that it's Tang. Uh, regardless, <laughs> it's not very delicious, so I try to, <laughs> I try to avoid that at all costs. And um, where am I going to go on vacation? Uh, I have two little kids. I've got a, uh, a six and an eight-year-old, and we are going on a cruise with a certain mouse who lives in Florida. And I'll tell you, I cannot wait to hug those kids. Bravo. Okay, Allie, you're up next. Hi again, Reed. So we hear a lot about space traffic and satellites in orbit, even about garbage in space. What should we know, and as the next generation, uh, be prepared to do to preserve space in the future? It's crowded up here, and it, it's a very good question. It's something that we need to, to look at seriously. Uh, we're totally protected from it. We have ground teams that are monitoring every little piece of space junk, and if we need to, we'll move the space station, and the ground teams will do that for us. Since I've been up here, we've done it three or four times, so it definitely occurs. I don't look out the windows and just see trash everywhere because it's just such a vast area up here. But a lot of the testing that we've done many years before, military testing especially, uh, anytime you blow something up up here, now you get a lot of chunks of little pieces. And, uh, and over time, we get crowded. So I think down the road, we are definitely going to have to look at cleaning up this, this area, especially from where I am, 260 miles, and then you start going a little bit higher. At least from where we are, that stuff will generally come back in and reenter the atmosphere. Uh, but you start getting a little bit higher, and there's nothing left to bring it back down. And, uh, and that's really the big problem area. Sonia? Hello again. Uh, first, let's go red. Um, that's reunion ever. Uh, my question for you is, when you get up every morning, what do you look forward to? I look forward to two things. 
First, we have found that there is uh, this dehydrated granola that we absolutely love. So uh, every seven days, we get to open a new breakfast container, and everybody dives in there to get their granola out. And after one or two days, it's gone, and then we're stuck eating uh, cornflakes and Cheerios. But uh, that granola is our prized possession. So it just goes to show you, even when you're in space, it's that regular human cravings that you have that uh, start to take over your mind. But really, the thing that we look forward to is uh, I go down to what we call Node 3, and uh, if I drop down under node three, we have the cupola, and it's seven gigantic windows. Each window is about this big, and then in the center, there's a huge window about this big around. And uh, the first thing we do in the morning is we open up those shutters, and we look down at our Earth. And it doesn't matter whether the sun is up or down, the stars are out, the aurora is there. It just doesn't matter. It's always awesome, and that's what we look forward to every morning. Reed, it's Dave again. How, being in space and on your trip so far, how has your trip uh, affected or has it affected your sense of priorities in education at places like RPI? The humanities, the sciences, all the parts and pieces. This is your chance to get to be, sorry Dr. Jackson, a college president. <laughs> and tell us what you would do. Oh, I, there's no way I can fill those shoes, so take back that st statement right now. But the thing, the thing is, is, we're explorers. That's what humans do. I can't tell you in my life, I've never walked up to a hill and not wanted to go to the top of it and see what the view is like. And uh, I think that's inside of all of us. I'm sure it's inside you. I'm sure it's in, inside everybody there watching right now. And so where we are as humanity, the only way we are going farther is with science, engineering, mathematics, these are the things that we need to propel us, to continue to propel us. And if you look around and say, oh, all the inventions have been made, you know, there's nothing more, that, that's such baloney. I mean, now we have iPhones in our pockets and I'm talking to you over a satellite link down at RPI for, for an alumni weekend, and we are just now starting to scratch the surface. And so we will use these tools, and it's just that exponential growth. And let's get ourselves out there. Let's see what's out there. Let's go investigate moons. Let's head to Saturn. Let's head to Jupiter. I want to see all that stuff. It might not be in my lifetime, but maybe in somebody in the audience right now, maybe they'll see this. Maybe they'll see a creature on a, on a moon that we've never even dreamed could happen. And to me, the, that's just that's the ultimate. Okay, our, our, our last formal question, Reed. So what you're doing up there looks truly amazing. Um, so when can we expect us common folks to be able to travel up to space? Because I really want to do a backflip and I probably can't do one down here. <laughs> no, I, I can't do them down there either, but I am getting very good at the front end backflips. Uh, it's great. So there's two answers to this question. You can try to become a professional astronaut or you're at RPI, so I think this is an easy one. Just get filthy rich and buy your way up here. <laughs> I just have to ask the pride question because one of the big questions I got on Twitter was not one but two astronauts representing RPI this last year. Do we have bragging rights across the entire university-wide system now? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think Purdue, Purdue, Purdue might argue with you, but right now, with uh, Rick Mastracchio and myself coming up here, I would say for sure, uh, there's no doubt in my mind, we've got bragging rights. <laughs> Before you go, we know you took some of your personal time to be with us. And I want to re reiterate how proud we are of you. I also want to thank you for telling the whole of planet Earth what you really think of and how great your alma mater really is. Because we produce great people like you. My dad always told me to reach for the stars, and that is what you've done. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. And uh, if this is not the best reunion and homecoming ever, wait until next year. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>